This is going to be a great video. I'm going to cover everything about high dynamic range photography. I'm, the how, the why, the when, the workflows. I'm going to explain what dynamic range is, how many stops we can see with our eyes, how many stops can high-end versus normal versus point-and-shoot cameras see? I'm going to even show you two ways to increase the dynamic range of any camera without HDR processing. And then, obviously, we're going to cover the steps of how to capture HDR images in camera. And I'm going to give you about two dozen case studies of two-shot images, three-shot, four-shot, five-shot, six-shot, and even eight-shot examples. And then I'm going to show you a lot of images to explain when you don't need HDR, like real-world case studies of several scenes with my approach to the why and the when. I wanna show you an indoor and outdoor HDR example, several backlit subject examples, and I'm gonna even show you my technique of how you can take just two shots without a tripod and manually combine them to get the benefits of HDR, but on the go. And then how do you tone your HDRs in Adobe Camera Raw? There's a lot of Adobe Camera Raw processing tips, techniques, and workflows in this video. And then of course, I'm gonna show you how to create a surreal, artsy, and illustrative image with an HDR image. This video is gonna be jammed packed. I hope you learn a lot. Bang, bang, baby, it's a new day. In photography, dynamic range is the contrast ratio between the darkest and the brightest tones that a camera can capture in a single exposure. Maximum dynamic range is the greatest range of light from deep shadows to the brightest highlights. Now, dynamic range is measured in stops. Each stop indicates a doubling or halving of the brightness level captured. The human eye can see up to a theoretical 24 stops of dynamic range, and that's only because our pupils are constantly adjusting, dilating and constricting to the bright and dark areas while our brain is also constantly processing all of that info instantly and kind of merging them together. Cameras can't do that because they have a very fixed aperture, right? Like if the aperture is like our pupils, once you set it, it doesn't get to change. So even high-end and fairly expensive DSLR and mirrorless cameras can only reach around 14 stops of dynamic range and most average price DSLRs can only see around 10 stops, and inexpensive point and shoots can only see five to eight stops. So let's talk about those 24 stops. So you know that an 8-bit JPEG image captures 256 tones of gray in each the red, green, and blue channel. That's what all of photography and all computer monitors are based on. You know they came up with that because they figured out that at 128 tones of gray, that's when the human eye could no longer differentiate between the separate tones. And then they said, hey, let's double it and we'll be covered. Let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna grab the linear gradient, drag from one side to the other. I get a continuous tonal range from pure black, which is zero, to pure white, which is 255. I'm gonna go up to image adjustments and posterize to simulate something. So if I t drag this over to 128 shades of gray, essentially scientists figured out that we couldn't figure this part out when it's printed. Now this is a 5K monitor, so I can actually see those differentiations in between. I can see lines between each shade of gray. But if I pull this all the way up to 255, which remember is actually 256 tones of gray because zero is counted as a number here, well then it looks seamless, right? But let's go to what our eye can see. So this is 24 striations or stops of gray. So in theory, our eye can see the whitest white and the darkest dark. But high-end DSLRs or mirrorless cameras they can only see any given 14 stops. So you have to make the choice. Do you want to expose for the brightest areas of the scene? Or do you want to expose your photograph for the darkest areas of the scene? Or do you want to expose it for somewhere in the middle? That's the choice that you have with high-end cameras. So if you have a camera that only captures five stops of dynamic range, you have less dynamic range to work with. But again, most averagely priced cameras, like that are in the four to $800 range, they're gonna capture 10 stops. And all of this is fine. We can work with any camera, but it means you have to kind of decide what area do you want to expose for. Now, in case you're curious, like what do we mean? Well, let's say you're going for the middle area here. If you were to photograph this middle area, your camera is gonna take that dynamic range and process it, making the brightest area pure white and the darkest area pure black. That's gonna give you that compressed tonal range of the 10 stops. Do you see how that works? The same is true if you wanted to take a picture of something in the darkest area of the image. It's gonna take that darkest area and recompress it 
to stretch it from black to pure white. But again, this is the debacle. You have to make a choice of where you're capturing your exposure. But with high dynamic range, you can take a shot here, then you can take a shot here, and then take a shot here, and have three shots that capture the range. And if you need to take multiple, that means you can take a shot here, shot here, a shot at normal, one stop over, two stop over, and then combine those five shots to get the perfect exposure. Now, why is it important to understand dynamic range? You see, understanding your camera's dynamic range is essential in order to avoid losing details from your photographs. Since cameras can't see what our eyes can see in a high contrast lighting situation with a single exposure, you typically have to choose between either exposing for the shadow areas and blowing out your highlights, which means turning the lighter areas of the photo white, or you can expose for the highlights and underexpose your dark shadow details, which typically is going to turn those darker areas of the photo black. A wider dynamic range allows you to capture both bright highlights and dark shadows. So I want to give you three tips for improving dynamic range in your photos with any camera that you have. First, you could use a graduated neutral density filter. A graduated neutral density filter limits the amount of light or luminance that reaches your camera sensor on only a part of the image, unlike regular ND filters, which affects the entire image. A graduated ND filter is like putting on sunglasses for just half of your lens. Now, landscape photographers typically find that graduated neutral density filters work best when shooting a flat horizon, since any objects in the top half of the image, like trees or buildings, would also be darkened by the filter. And even though you can rotate most neutral density filters, typically the environments that we're in doesn't really equate to that perfect linear line of a bright area and a dark area. So the second tip is just add artificial lighting to increase the dynamic range. You see, if you use a camera flash or extra lights to fill in the darkest area of the photo, this will decrease the range of light that your camera needs to capture. This solution is ideal for close range photos because flash and additional lights won't help you when you're shooting scenes that are in a far distance. So if you're taking a picture of a ninja at night, in order to capture the richness of the night with the specular highlights properly exposed in the background, you just need to turn on your flash to accurately record the ninja. The third option is to try high dynamic range photography, also known as HDR photography. High dynamic range photography is a post-processing technique that involves combining photos taken with multiple different exposures into a single optimized image. To execute an HDR photo, shoot the same photo at several exposures to capture the entire range of light intensities. Then use photo editing software to merge the photos together. HDR is sometimes the only available option for producing a properly exposed photograph, but its major drawback is that you can't use it with moving subjects typically. Basically, there are two reasons to make an HDR or high dynamic range photograph, necessity and creativity. And because those reasons often overlap, you have a great opportunity to reimagine the scene into the photo you want it to be. So how do you shoot an HDR multi-exposure shot? Because it does start in camera, and this is easy. First, lock your camera down on a tripod. This is essential for proper image registration in the software later. You're going to compose and set your normal exposure and take the picture. Then you're going to leave your f-stop and your ISO alone, and you're only going to adjust your exposure with the shutter speed. And remember, if you're dropping below 1 60th of a second, even on a tripod, you still need to use your self-timer or cable release to trigger the shutter release. Because even when you are pushing the shutter release button, you could cause vibrations that would make your image slightly blurry. Now, what's the series? At minimum, you need at least three shots. So you're going to capture one shot at the normal exposure, whatever the camera tells you is a properly exposed normal shot. And then you're going to take one additional shot at two stops overexposed and another additional shot at two stops underexposed. That gives you three shots that should cover most normal brightness ranges. Now, if you have time, try shooting with five shots. Capture one at normal exposure, one shot at plus one stop over and plus two stops over, and go back and shoot another shot at minus one stop under and minus two stops under. This is going to give you five shots to capture the entire brightness range. Now you can do this with up to seven to nine shots if the scene requires it. 
and try experimenting with it. But typically I found I never need more than five shots to get great results. And most times I can get away with three. So when should you use HDR? I mean, there are times that you definitely need it and it would benefit your image to use it. But I see in a lot of beginning photographers that they don't know exactly when to use it and often they use it when they don't really need to. Let's take a look at these images, this exposure series. So this image over here was exposed at 250th of a second at f11 at ISO 100, which as you know is the basic sunny 16 rule. So in photography, the sunny 16 rule, which is also known as the sunny f16 rule, is a method of estimating correct daylight exposures without a light meter. The basic rule is, on a sunny day, set the aperture to f16 and the shutter speed to the reciprocal of the ISO setting for any subject in direct sunlight. For example, on a sunny day with ISO 100 setting in the camera, just set the aperture to f16 and the shutter speed, the exposure time, to either 1 100th or 1 125th. Or on a sunny day with ISO 200 setting and aperture at f16, set the shutter speed to 1 200th or 1 250th. And the last example, on a sunny day with ISO 400 and an aperture at f16, just set the shutter speed to 1 400th or 1 500th. Again, this is just an old rule that was just created before light meters, but now you can still use the rule to kind of verify what your exposure is, because remember, your camera will sometimes lie to you. So again, on a sunny day with distinct shadow lines, if you're at f16 and your ISO is the same as your shutter speed, you're going to get a good, correct, normal exposure. So if this is the normal exposure, what you would expect to get, out on a bright sunny day with distinct shadows, well then this shot is one stop under, this shot is two stops under, this is one shot overexposed, two stops overexposed, three stops overexposed, four stops overexposed, five stops overexposed. So now ask yourself, why are you shooting high dynamic range? Or the goal is in high contrast scenes, your camera is not gonna be able to record the detail in both the highlight and the shadow areas. But here's the thing, highlight and shadow areas are not always important to the image. So let's see what I mean. This is the normal exposure. What well, my camera says is a good exposure. For me, I would probably go one stop over just to make it a touch brighter and then pull the sky back down with some dehaze and maybe pull the highlights down just a touch. Because I know if I skew my exposure to the right side of the histogram, I'm just going to be collecting more data and more data is always good. But again, even at this shot, one stop over, remember HDR allows you to see all the detail in the highlight areas and all the detail in the shadow areas but where are the shadow areas in this particular image predominantly in the depths of the trees but if I could see the shadow areas deep in here it's just going to make it visually busy so I would argue that I don't need to see the detail inside of these dark pockets in the trees I think that variation makes the form look more three-dimensional and nice so where else have I blocked up my detail underneath this cloak I've blocked up the detail and this half of his face, making it more of a split light type portrait. Generally speaking, I would argue that sometimes having blocked up shadow detail adds a rich graphic element to an image and actually makes it a bit more interesting to look at. Let's take a quick look at this image. It's a JPEG, so I'm just gonna right click and choose Open in Camera Raw. It'll open up the Camera Raw dialog box, and I've already processed this. If I hold the Alt or Option key, notice how this changes from Basic to Reset Basic? So that's gonna reset all of my sliders. So this is what the image looks like straight out of camera. And it does look about one stop over, but let's see what I can do about that. Obviously, I'd want to bring back that blue sky, and dehaze is great for skies. That'll help saturate the sky a little bit, saturate all the colors. I'll probably go ahead and pull down my highlights just a touch, and I like that. Do I need this information that's right inside this cloak? I would argue that I don't. For that reason, I would say there's no good reason to create a long exposure series just to get this little bit of detail here and on that side of the face because I think it looks like a dramatic image as it stands. Look at this series of three images. The one on the left is what my camera said was normal exposure, which was one eighth of a second at f22 at ISO 100. And then I wanted to demonstrate that sometimes there, there is no sky to get, like that blown out white area is just no detail. So by underexposing by three stops, 
taking my exposure to 1 60th at f22, I can see there's no rich cloud information in the sky. And then I took one shot two stops overexposed in order to get more of the shadow detail and the detail in, in the color in the, in the sign and the chairs in this little wet area is what interested me about the scene. Is this a great series for high dynamic range compositing? I would say it's not. I would say there's plenty of information here in this two-stop overexposed image. So I'm going to right-click, open in camera raw. Okay, I've blown out all of that. That's fine. I may just put a new sky in there that aligns with the scene in Photoshop with the new sky replacement options. But for now, again, pull that down just a touch to make sure nothing's being blown out. Just looking at the sign, maybe I'd make the vibrance a little more, maybe even make it just a little brighter because this is what I, I'm caring about. And for this image, I think I would just open it up and manipulate it in Photoshop with some dodging and burning with layer masks, which is going to give me this image. And what I've done is I've saturated and darkened the background. I've kept the sign and the tables kind of as a point of interest, and I put a bit of a cloudy look in the background. So I would argue you don't need HDR for that particular image. So let's look at this series. Right here is what our eyes see. We see the highlight detail in the sky and obviously the subject is primarily backlit but our eyes see all this detail in here as well but our camera doesn't we literally have to choose if we open up our exposure and expose for the shadow detail it's going to blow out any highlight detail making it go totally white and if we expose for the sky the highlight detail it's going to underexpose the shadow detail and make it go black. So yes, this would be a great one to do an HDR series with. So let's look at this series of images. So this is obviously an indoor-outdoor situation. So you could be inside of any architectural structure looking through a window. Generally speaking, if you're exposing for the inside, it's going to blow out that outside detail because that's going to be too bright for a camera to record. And if I stop down three stops to get that highlight detail well exposed, well, that's going to underexpose the area that, that wasn't getting much light. So this is a good situation to combine them and create an HDR image where you get a well exposed interior and a well exposed exterior. This particular series was taken with an iPhone, hence the, the bit of noise you see in the color and the luminance here. Okay, so look at this situation. Backlit subject, if I expose for the sky, it's going to underexpose the cool part of the bird. So if I open up a couple stops to get that shadow detail, it entirely blows out the sky. So yeah, I think this would be a perfect situation for HDR. Unfortunately, this is one of those ones where I wasn't on a tripod, I was moving quick, and I knew that I would have to manually just composite these images in Photoshop with layer masking. So I use a trick where I just take two shots, one for the highlight detail, one for the shadow detail, and I merge them myself manually, which I'll show you how to do. But in looking at the shot, I thought, okay, well, what's most important? The, what most fascinating was the shape of the eagle. Even though I did like that foreground element over here in the left, I thought that could be something really nice. But all this information in the background was really distracting, the power lines, the other signs. So I walked up closer and tilted my camera up to really focus on just the eagle. And that allowed me to manually composite to get this image. So I've got tons of shadow detail in the shadow area, which I could see with my eye, and I've still got that nice blue sky. And then you should always ask yourself, is there anything in the image that's distracting to me? So I felt like these, this foliage on the far left wasn't necessary. I've already got a nice leading diagonal line pulling me into the image. This little smokestack I thought was distracting. So I spot retouched them. And then I added a bit of clarity and sharpening to really draw attention to the metallic finish of, of the, the eel. And then just to try and be more creative, I thought... I wonder what this would look like with more of a blue tint on the statue. And that's where I ended up. This is a common scene, right? Shadows are fairly distinct. It looks like it's a sunny day. And there's a four stop difference between these two shots. So if I expose for the highlight detail, well, in four stops, that shadow detail is going to totally block up because it's not getting hit by any sun. Sun's only hitting this rim of this bush and then all of this foreground. But if I open up four stops to get the shadow detail well exposed back here, well, what did I do? That four stops is going to blow out the top of the bush and everything that was in the foreground. But this is another one of those situations where I was walking and moving 
I was trying to get it quick and dirty. So I just took those two shots and I merged them manually in Photoshop, which again, I'll show you how to do, to create this shot, which is what my eyes saw. Because I really loved the, the color of the leaves. I like the contrast of the rectilinear man-made structure encroaching in the organic part of nature. Like it, it just seemed like a really interesting visual contrast. But again, this was a manual situation. Okay, so let me go ahead and just show you how to manually do this. I'm gonna select the two images that I want to composite together. I'm gonna to go up to Tools, down to Photoshop, and I'm not going to merge to HDR Pro because I wasn't on a tripod. So I'm just gonna do Load Files into Photoshop Layers. Otherwise, I'd have to open them up individually, copy one image and paste it into another. Photoshop's gonna do all that for me and it's not gonna clog up my RAM to do it the way you just saw. Now I'm gonna turn off this eyeball, see how far off I am. I'm pretty far off, right? Like if I hit Command or Control R to activate the rulers on the left side and top of my screen, I can hover inside the ruler and just bring one out to the furthest corner of the step. Turn that off. So look at that. I'm at least eight or nine inches off. So what do I do? I select both of them by holding down the Command or Control key and selecting the other layer. It could be five other layers. And then I would go up to Edit and auto align layers. And Photoshop's gonna do its best to figure it out. Now it's saying it should probably use perspective to figure it out. So I'm gonna let Photoshop make its best guess and do what it can do. I'll click okay, and let's see how it did. Turn off your eyeball, move it to this one right here. Turn my eyeball on and off. And yeah, it's not moving at all, it looks perfect. Remember, you can also pull down from the horizontal. If you have a horizontal line, you can match up with. So yeah, that looks perfect. I'm going to view, clear guides, because I don't want to see those anymore. Now, it had to skew my image around a little bit, right? So uh, that part can't be avoided. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit C for crop. I'm going to pull my crop in, pull this in, pull that in. All right, so when I turn this off, well, look what happens. I lose this whole left side of the image, but I don't care, because mostly it's the shadow detail here that I need from this image. And I don't even mind if it goes into deep shadow as it goes across. So now I just need to add a layer mask to this top image, because overall it has the best exposure for the highlights. I'll hit B for the brush, make sure I'm painting with black in the foreground. I'm gonna go ahead and drag this to 100%. A scrubby slider is when you hover over a word and your cursor changes to a left or right pointing arrow and you just drag it back and forth to vary the opacity. I'm gonna go ahead and drag this to 100% and just paint in that shadow detail I want. Now, as I get over here, I'm going to go down to 40% and do a tap and 20% by tapping the number two, getting 20% in my opacity and doing another tap. Now I'm going to have to go back to 100% by tapping zero and tap X so I can paint with white because I need to paint this back in with a couple of clicks to try and fade it in. Maybe this part's a little bright, so I'll tap two for 20% and do a couple of taps just to pull that back down. Maybe I'll vignette it just a little bit. But overall, this has given me a really quick blending. Now watch this. I always want to merge everything I've done into one single image. Command, Option, Shift, Letter E is the quickest way to do that. Now I can take the whole thing over to Adobe Camera Raw. And this was a JPEG originally, so I've, I've just basically created a larger dynamic range by blending those two. Now I can do the things I would want to do, like maybe I want to pull down my highlights a little bit. I'd still want to pull up my shadows a little bit maybe and maybe throw in some clarity and a little dehaze to saturate some stuff. But pull down my, say I don't want to make things blacker because I'm blocking up that detail. So maybe I'd pull that down, something like that. Maybe for this one, I would go ahead and choose effects and put a little uh, vignette on it. Go back to basics. If I want to raise the vibrance just a touch to make those green leaves greener. Remember, saturation will make your eyes bleed. But vibrance only increases the saturation of the color channels that are not saturated already. That's how you manually align two quick shots to get the image that you envision without having to set up a tripod and do a very intensive HDR session. Sometimes you can just expose one shot for the highlights, one shot for the shadows, try to stay as still as you can, keep your f-stop the same so the depth of field doesn't change, and just adjust the exposure with your shutter speed. So let's take this image, normally exposed. I've got nice whites, nice, nice, there's some probably some black down in here. So it's a good exposure. Is there any reason to take an HDR of this? I would argue there's not. What's it gonna buy me to overexpose a couple of stops and under underexpose a couple of stops? Like there's no extra detail here that I need. Like I would argue that I have this detail here. Now this is a JPEG. If I had shot it in RAW, I definitely wouldn't have any worry. Let's open the normal exposure in camera raw. See there's 
I've got my highlight clipping turned on, right? Remember, if you if you have blown out highlights, it shows it shows up in red. I don't have any blown out highlights. Well, it looks like now I do. So just pull down the highlight slider just a touch. And how's my black? That shadow warning turned on. So let me, sh okay, it's showing me in blue where I'm losing my black detail. I would argue there's no reason to do a high dynamic range of this shot, even though I could. There's no wind, it's inside, nothing's gonna change from image to image. But the extra work is not buying me anything, right? The only reason you're doing this extra work is because it's a high contrast scene that the camera cannot capture because the dynamic range is too great. So this is not one that needs it. Okay, let's look at this series. Really cool kind of sky in the background, but the bright colors of the tree. This is one that would be definitely a good shot at, at HDR, right? No. I mean, what if the wind's blowing? I mean, this is a tree. That means everything's going to be a little blurry. There is a de-ghosting feature in the uh, HDR box, but I shot these as raw, which remember, a JPEG, an 8-bit JPEG, only 256 tones of gray in each the RGB channel. And when I say RGB, obviously you know I mean red, green, blue, because it takes red, green, and blue light to make white light when they're mixed equally. With the most basic raw capture, you're capturing a minimum of 4,096 levels of tones in each the RGB channel. So I would argue, and because I know from experience, I would maybe... Take this shot. It looks like it's uh, maybe a stop over exposed, which is a default for me. I would take this one and I can double click this because it's a raw file to open automatically. And I know that I can pull this back with the dehaze. See, now I'm blocking up a little bit of blacks there in the, the shadow areas of the tree, but I'd say I don't care. And if I did, I could just pull this black slider back to mitigate that. I can open up my shadow slider to make those trees a little brighter. And already maybe throw in a little this Pull down the highlights just a touch. And I can even pull it all the way over here if I needed to, but I, I don't think I need to. I have enough detail here that I don't need to worry so much about, again, an HDR image for this particular scene. Let's do a different version. Let's do one with one stop darker and show you this time I'm just gonna open up the shadows in the trees and see what that looks like. Pull down that sky. That still looks really nice. So I'm gonna open up the two stops underexposed. Now watch how much detail I can pull out with the shadow slider. Very minim minimal noise. Actually, I don't see really hardly any noise in this image. And now pull in the sky a little more. Maybe saturate that a bit. And I can still pull that exposure up a little. So again, this is not an image that I would, I would bother with creating an HDR capture. Then when you've captured the images, you're just going to take them into a post-production software. I'm going to show you how to use Adobe Bridge and Adobe Photoshop to merge all the images with HDR Pro which is a free plugin extension that comes automatically with Photoshop. That part's pretty easy, let's get to it. Okay, so look at this scene. This is just a bit of video I shot before I took the next images I'm gonna show you. Like this is just a normal bright sunny day, I'm inside underneath the bridge, and I knew right away I didn't need an HDR composite where I needed to shoot a bracket of three or five images or something. Essentially, I just have everything's exposed by bright sun, and then I have this railing and this archway inside the tunnel that's in deep shadow. So I only needed two exposures. I needed one to capture all the highlight detail appropriately, which is basically everything here that's being sunlit. So the exposure is basically five stops open to get this shadow detail. I had to, and I was on a tripod, which obviously I kept my f-stop at f11. I'm at ISO 100. And I went from 3 20th down to... I think something like an eighth of a second. Yeah, almost five stops to get this shot. And since it was on a tripod, I didn't have to worry about camera movement, but I knew that's all I needed to get the image. And quite honestly, this is not an image, this is not a series of images that I would even bother with HDR. Quite honestly, I would just open them in camera raw, uh, process them individually. Like what would I wanna do? Up the saturation, pull up the dehaze, and I'm only looking at the, the background. Maybe the saturation is wrong, maybe more vibrance because I don't want to you know, make colors bleed. There's a problem with the crookedness of it, but I'll deal with that later. But overall, I feel like 
this is already making the background look, look really nice. And then I come over to this image, like this is a great image to go ahead and pull up the clarity. And again, I only care about this wall to make sure there's no kind of halation blur problem right here. I will see if I can pull down those highlights. See, I can do that, but it, it didn't affect really anything here. It just maybe affected this edge. So maybe I would pull up the dehaze to give it some saturation and contrast inside here. Maybe pull down the exposure, just the barest of touch open up the shadows a little bit, and then I'm gonna click done for both of those. Do you see this little notation right here? This is saying, let me zoom in. Do you see this notation right here in the upper corner? This is telling me that there's been some kind of camera raw adjustment. So now what I would do is go to tools, Photoshop, load files into Photoshop layers, so I've made a powerful exposure adjustment and tweaks in Adobe Camera Raw on a raw processed image. And then Photoshop's going to load both images together in the same document. So I don't have to do copying and pasting. I'm gonna turn off an eyeball. Okay, I was on a tripod, so nothing moved. How perfect is that? I'm gonna actually let Photoshop do it. I'm gonna choose a quick selection tool and say just, I'm on this top layer. I'm saying just select this really dark area right here. Let me poke in at selected mask and see what it looks like. It doesn't look horrible. I've already got smart radius checked. I'm smoothing by three, feathering by 1.9. And now just leave it output to new layer with layer mask, click OK. And it's going to turn off the, the original layer, right? And you're looking at it, you're like, well, nothing, nothing changed, right? But that's because I selected this because I thought it would have a better chance of selecting this really solid dark object. So I'm just going to grab that mask and pull it down and then pull this above and voila, I have an immediate blending of the two. And now we just need to use our craft. I'm gonna hit B for brush. I need to paint with white. I don't want to paint at 100%. I'm gonna paint like at 40%. So I'm just gonna tap the four key. And I'm just gonna paint right here. I don't want to paint on the image though. I want to make sure I select the layer mask. See the four corners are, are identified. And I'm just gonna paint right here. I need to hit X because I do need to paint with white. So I just want to brighten that up a little, not a ton. And here I'm gonna do the opposite. I'm gonna tap X to go back to black because I'm painting on this white mask and I'm gonna leave it, I'm gonna hit two for 20%. I just wanna make it a little darker at the top. Maybe vignette the corners a little bit so it looks a little more natural. Maybe come up from the bottom just a little bit. And if I went too far, I can hit Command Z or I can hit X, make a smaller brush and vary the, the intensity of what I've done. Hit X again. Bigger brush, maybe make this a little darker at the top and in the corner, maybe come in a little bit like that, just to vary it. So again, you don't want everything to look so uniform because in nature it's not uniform. But this is a really quick way to dramatically increase the dynamic range of your image that more closely aligns with what I actually saw. Actually, I think I would go ahead and pull this edge down just a little bit. It looks a little bright right against everything else, just to make it look more natural. So there we go. And here is the image after making all the tweaks. Here's another series. I was on the go. I didn't have a tripod, but I knew that if I took this normal exposure, it's a backlit subject. So that means I'm not going to get a good exposure on the subject. I'm not going to get a good exposure on the sky. Everything back here that's being sunlit is going to be kind of overexposed. So if I go for an exposure of the sky, well, that's just going to really almost silhouette this backlit subject. And if I open up my shot, gather all the detail in the subject, it totally blows out everything else. And since I wasn't on a tripod, I'm going to have to manually blend these together the way you just saw me do it. So had I shot this on a tripod, this would be a good one to use HDR on, but you, you really need pretty close image registration for HDR to be effective. And then I would turn on the deghosting feature because notice like there's a bus here, but the bus isn't here in any of these images. Like that way I would just identify one image for Photoshop to say, hey, anything that's different, we're not gonna use. Okay, let's look at this th three shot series. Look at this shot. This is, again, this is a great candidate for HDR. The, the sky in this part of the building and this part here are being lit by direct sunlight and the shadows, they fall into deep darkness when I expose for these highlighted areas. And this is again, a, a sunny 16 rule kind of thing. If I open up one stop, it sort of blows out my highlights, but not a lot. It sort of gives me some good shadow detail, but not enough. And if I open up two stops, notice how much good shadow detail I have. 
Now there's no directional lighting. I would need to bump up my contrast, but again, this would be a great series to process in camera raw, but what's the problem? I didn't use a tripod. This is handheld. So every shot is minutely different enough that it's gonna give me a problem and I'd have to manually blend these. So this shot, this is very much like the bridge I just showed you. If I capture the exposure here for the foreground that's being lit by very specific lighting, well, this background's gonna fall into deep shadow. So if I expose for the shadow area that's being more dimly lit in the background, all this foreground totally blows out. And because I was on a tripod, I did merge these with HDR and I created this image. Let me show you how. So again, whether you have two images, which is rare that that's gonna work for you, usually you need at least three, but here's two. You just select all the images, you go up to tools, Photoshop, over to merged HDR Pro. It's gonna think for a minute, it's gonna open the images up in Photoshop, put them together in one layer, and then it's gonna open up the merge to HDR dialog box, already compressing them together. Now notice it doesn't give me the option to check remove ghosts. That's because this detected no real variance between them, even though that water was moving. Essentially, you're gonna leave it at 32-bit mode that has the most data, and you're gonna leave checked the complete toning in Adobe Camera Raw, because we already know the Adobe Camera Raw interface, and we're just gonna to say tone in ACR. It's gonna go back to Photoshop, then it's gonna launch the most current version of Camera Raw. So now all the data from the highlight exposure and the shadow exposure are all in one image. So now I can just come up to shadows and brighten up my shadows and I can brighten up the overall exposure and I can pull down the highlights for anything that's being blown out. And I very quickly get an image that I could see with my eyes, but couldn't ca capture in one image in my camera. And I still have the ability to tweak. I can go up to masking. The masking opened just outside of the recording window for some reason, but I'm gonna go down to linear gradient. I'm gonna pull up and remember I can either turn off the overlay here or as soon as I make an adjustment, it's gonna turn off automatically. So I'm gonna pull up the clarity and the dehaze. I'm gonna turn off that overlay because I want it just to go away for a minute. And maybe I wanna pull the exposure down just a touch. And then I'm gonna do create a new mask and choose linear gradient. I'm gonna come from the top and turn off the overlay. Maybe here, I wanna bump the saturation of the, the top. I wanna to raise the shadow values again. Maybe brighten up the exposure just a touch. So very quickly, I've processed everything in Adobe Camera Raw. I'm gonna click OK. It's gonna take me back to Photoshop. And this is the image I ended up with, giving me kind of the best of both worlds. Now look at this series. This was a night exposure series. So I captured eight shots. And why did I choose to do this? Well, this was probably the normal exposure, what my camera said to do. And notice I have no detail in the deep dark shadow areas. All these areas are very flat and muddy looking. I'm losing the richness of the buildings. So if I underexpose again, I'm gonna get a bluer sky and I get better highlight detail. And if I underexpose again, I get more highlight detail just on these really spotlights. See, that's the thing with night photography. You really have to, to shoot multiple exposures beyond three to capture the entire range of the scene from the bright highlights to the, the deep, dark shadows. So if that's normal, then I opened up one stop, two stop, three stop, four stop. So what are we noticing? This shot is blurry. I mean, I'm on a tripod, but I must have bumped it because it's a little blurry compared to the others. So what would I do? I would move that one to the trash. I would say, I'd say this shot is also blurry. Look at the writing right here. Obvious camera movement, and that's kind of the hazard. So what am I left with? I'm left with these shots, these six shots. And all you have to do is tools, merge to HDR Pro. Sometimes you might get a message saying Photoshop's busy with another task. You know it's not, it's a bug in the system. Just click yes that you'd like to cue this command and it will immediately get to work. I'm gonna open all the images in Photoshop and then it will launch into merged HDR Pro dialog box. Maybe some flags are moving. Let's see if I can remove ghost. I can, so there must've been some movement somewhere. So I get to choose, see at the bottom, I'm clicking to choose which image I like the best. Probably gonna choose this image. I'm gonna complete toning in Adobe Camera Raw, click tone in ACR. It's gonna go back to Photoshop and then it's gonna launch in Adobe Camera Raw with all the image data from all six images. So now I can raise my shadow value and it's really gonna raise it. I can raise my exposure, pull down my highlights so I don't blow out anything. I can pull up my clarity, dehaze, 
you see how I, I'm quickly getting some good results. But remember, you can still add a mask. I'm gonna do this with the brush, right bracket key. Because remember, the craft of photography is still here. You're still gonna have to dodge and burn to really make the image sing. So I wanna raise the exposure of that area a little bit. This is a good surface to bump up the clarity. And here I can actually bump up the shadow detail yet again, raise the exposure even a little more, make sure I'm not blowing out any of the highlight areas. Remember, if you're shooting at F11, F16, or F22, if you're not cleaning your sensors regularly, you're gonna have some dust spots. So remember, you can always come up to the spot removal tool, choose visualize spots, it's gonna help you identify them. See, I can see them really easily and click, and it will auto choose something to, to pull from. But, but you can grab the green part, see if it, see how it, if it had chose something odd, you just grab it and move it to wherever you want. But this lets you quickly identify all the spots in the image that you may not always see. And see, see how much more spots we see as we enhance it? All of these are dust spots that you wouldn't see until you printed it or you were looking at it at 100% which is the reason you're supposed to always critique your images at 100% before you send them to the printer. So I have a ton of dust spots in this. And I'm sure I have more, but th these are the ones that are right over the dark areas, which are kind of easier to see. So I can get rid of all my dust spots quickly, go back to the basic control panel, and then ask, well, what else would I like to do? Maybe a little bit more. So again, this is where you process to your taste, right? After my processing, this is the image that I ended up with that I really enjoyed. Now this series of a canal in Venice, obviously good choice for HDR. I was on a tripod. I do have moving people, right? So that part's bad. But obviously if I expose for the sunlit area here, everything in dark shadow is gonna have zero detail. So here's a shot underexposed to try and just make sure I've got all the highlight detail possible. And then I start overexposing to really make sure I get the shadow detail. I'm gonna to choose Tools, Photoshop, Merge to HDR Pro. And the only reason I'm going into this one, because you know how to do it now, is just to show you specifically that Remove Ghost feature, because you'll see it very specifically in this one, because there's so many tourists walking around. Again, it's gonna open all of the images in Photoshop in one document. It's gonna automatically align the selected layers based on content, which again, this should only be subtle alignment. You do need a tripod for best results. Then it's gonna open all images compressed into one document. And I'm gonna choose remove ghosts. And look what happens when I uncheck that. Do you see how the people are merging in and out of each other? They look transparent. That's because it's anything that's moving, it's blending them together at lower opacities because there are different exposure values. So just click remove ghost. It chose this particular image. So basically, you're just basically choosing where you want your tourists to be. These two, it's not working at all because of the exposure. They're a little, a little too underexposed. So it's gonna be between these two shots. I'm gonna go with this one. And then just tone and ACR. I'm gonna go back to Photoshop, and then it's gonna launch Camera Raw. And again, pull up the shadow detail, pull up the exposure, pull down the highlights, see what dehaze is gonna do for me for that uh, bright, brighter area. Check that exposure. So this is where I'm gonna to have to probably go in with a little bit of brush adjustment again. So, but this is more than I could have done if I had done this to totally with just one image. Let me show you, I'm gonna cancel out of that. And I'm just gonna open this image. This was the normal image in Adobe Camera Raw. Open up the shadows. I gotta say, it really didn't do a bad job. So could I possibly improve this with the brush, paint over this? super shadowy area real quick. Turn off the overlay and just raise the exposure. Add some clarity and dehaze for contrast. I gotta say, power of raw images. Remember, our eyes can see a problem less than 128 levels of tones. And JPEG images captures 256 tones, but the least expensive camera that captures the lowest quality raw file still captures 4,096 levels of tones in each of the RGB color channels. And most newer cameras capture way more than that nowadays. So even with just one exposure, I can really get a pretty usable image. If you're really into capturing all the details, as minimal noise as possible, that means there's a chance there could be some noise in here. Let me open that up. I'll go over to Photoshop. Command one, so I can see it at 100%. Space bar. So I'm gonna see what, uh, well, there you go. See, that's the difference, look at that. You see the noise here? 
I'm going to have to zoom in past 100% so that you'll see it hopefully through the, the video compression. But that's where you're going to have noise is in the shadow area. So we can, we can make the image visible, right? We can make it visible for like a court case. But if this is going to be a big print, well, even an 8 by 10 inch print, all this noise in the shadow areas is going to be horrific. And then obviously in the highlight areas, that's where the exposure was the best. So there was a lot of pixel data. So you're not going to have noise there. But this is a great image to create that artistic, surreal, or illustrative idea. Well, how do we, how do, we do that? I'm going to open up that image. Hopefully I've got layers in there. How good I do. Double click to close my tabs. I just want to walk you through my thought process. If you click and drag over your eyeballs, they all disappear. Command zero to fill my screen. So this is my HDR image. And you can see I've got a couple problems like right over here, right? Where I've lost some heads. They're hollow, but I don't care because I'm going to make this an illustration anyway. It's not a photograph. So I go up one that looks like I've brightened up this area. And then I just went a bit crazy with the saturation and lowering the detail in the Adobe Camera Raw slider. Looks like I've now applied a cutout filter. And then I went in and made that brighter. And then I just put on some text. I'm gonna select all of these, hit Command or Control G to put them in a group, hide them, go back to this, Command Option Shift letter E to compress everything to its own layer since I had a couple of layers being blended together here. And I'm just gonna do it for you. Filter, Camera Raw Filter. There's a lot of ways to do it. I like to go here first. Uh, maybe I pull down the clarity a little bit, which is soften things. I like to go to the detail slider and just crank up that color reduction, noise reduction. If I'm going for an illustration, go back to basic. Well, obviously we want some color, so let's crank up the vibrance. Maybe pull up the saturation a touch. That's going in an interesting direction. I'll click OK. I'll go back to filter, filter gallery. I'm going to choose cutout. And I get to vary my levels and the edge simplicity and fidelity. Just play with the sliders until you get something that, that you like. I want it to be a little bit like reality, like not a crazy abstract painting specifically, but I'm thinking more of a creative postcard. So I'm going to click OK. And I don't know that I did this on the other one, but I'd probably go back in and go stylize, hit it with a little bit of oil paint. See how that looks. Actually, that doesn't look bad. Oh, that does look bad. That was too much. So ideally for each different thing you do, go ahead and duplicate the layer ahead of time so you can lower the opacity or change the blend mode to create a new effect. Since this was the last thing I did, I can go back to edit and I can choose fade oil paint. Like don't apply it so much. Something like that, right? Or I'll make command Z, command Z, hit command J to duplicate it. And because I just applied the oil paint filter, remember down here in stylize an oil paint, but Photoshop always remembers the very last filter you applied, which was this oil paint filter. So if I click this, I don't get to make any adjustments. It just reapplies what it applied a moment ago. So I'm gonna click that. It's too, too much, right? Too heavy. I can still go up to fade oil paint, but now I have control of my layers panel since I applied the oil paint on its own layer. So now I can say, oh, just lower the opacity. Maybe let's make the colors more saturated. And then now that I'm blending two layers together, I want to work on just one image again. So I'm going to hit Command, Option, Shift, Letter E. And for me, I just want to hit Command, L, bring up the Levels dialog box, because I think I just want to, I want it to be bright and cheery. This is a postcard. I want people to be happy. I want people to buy this. Venice, Italy. You don't have to use words or text for your surreal idea. I just wanted you to know that HDR is known for being over-processed to the point where it's not really a photograph anymore. It looks more like a digital illustration. So feel free to go down that path if that interests you. You're actually required to do one of these for the, the projects that I've assigned. Typically, this is a very common HDR scene where this is a very backlit subject. You'll start to recognize what are HDR photos because you're going to learn that there's no way we could have captured a backlit subject, right? The sun's back here setting or rising, and we have such amazingly rich highlight, you know, sky detail, colors and tones. But this would have been totally in shadow. So obviously this is an HDR photograph and it's been well done in a very photorealistic way. So here's another good example of an HDR image. It has a six bracket exposure range from minus six stops all the way to plus three stops. And again, sometimes the brightness range just requires that much 
extra exposure. So here are all the exposure times. Obviously, you always keep your ISO and your f-stop consistent, and you adjust your exposure time with only your shutter speeds, which is why it's a real necessity to be on a tripod, not only to lock the image registration, but also because a lot of times the shutter speeds will go below a 60th of a second where you couldn't handhold it anyway and have it stay sharp. And this is a good example of a, a realistic HDR composite. And here is a more of an artistic interpretation. And then here's another series where seven images have been combined together. Again, keeping the f-stop and the ISO the same, locked on a tripod. And then you'll start to realize like, oh, I can either expose for the shadow detail in the garage, or I can expose for this background detail that's being lit by the sun. Even though our eyes can see this, like when we look at the scene, we don't see this or this. We see this. And that's what the goal of HDR ultimately is, is to be able to compress that high contrast scene with a huge dynamic range down into one photo. So when you see a shot and you're like, oh, that's inside not being lit by direct sun, obviously this is an HDR image. And this is too sophisticated to try and mask it. Remember my technique of to take a shot of a great exposure of either the dark area, like inside of a tunnel or here inside of a garage, and then take a great highlight exposure of the outside, and you can combine them manually with masking. The only time that really works are like in my examples, where they're just very clear, simple shapes that would be very easy to mask, right? That makes sense. Like here, we're seeing through windows. We've got all these cords. We've got all these intricate cords and handlebars here. Like this would not be one to try that quick and dirty technique on. This is one where you got to really lock it down and let Photoshop do all the math for you because the masking would just be too labor intensive. I want to talk about this image for a minute. And again, it's very much like some of the others where I was on the go. I wasn't on a tripod. I took two quick shots capturing a highlight detail and the shadow detail, and I merged them together to create this image. And this is super straightforward. Here's this image. Here's that image. I created a mask. It looks like that. And then went in and manipulated this a bit in Adobe Camera Raw to get the color tinting I wanted. This is another good example of why you would need to use a tripod to merge two shots because the camera can't see both inside this tunnel and outside in the sunny day. So you've got to merge them so that you can create an image where you've got detail on the inside and detail on the outside if that is important to you. So let's take a look at this series. I locked it on a tripod. So this is the normal exposure for this scene based on the sunny 16 rule. So I'm actually getting some shadow detail from the reflected light kind of illuminating over here. That's why it's not doing it there because this light is bouncing to over here, right? Again, this is one of those ones where do you even really need to do an HDR? It's a DNG file, which is a camera raw that I've converted to DNG. If I double click it, it opens in camera raw. Can I pull up that shadow detail enough? This is a great one for clarity. Pull up some dehaze. Do I care that I'm getting this little blocked up black areas? I don't think I do, but I can always try and minimize that a little bit if I, if I want to, or I can lower the contrast a little bit if I want to. But overall, I, that doesn't totally bother me. If you're in a pinch, if you're shooting raw, you're gonna be able to salvage the image really well. And I'd argue you probably don't even have to shoot HDR for this particular scene because there's that reflected light coming in, which is very different than that tunnel we just looked at, right? But again, going back, if, so this is normal, and this is one shot underexposed, and I definitely have all the highlight detail, right? Like it's starting to get a little muddy and underexposed looking, even in the highlight area. So I totally have all that detail. So this is where I go the other way. I take two stops over exposed, like one stop over, two stops over, and I'm totally blowing out the highlights really badly, but I'm making sure I've got plenty of detail way back in here if, if for some reason I'm really fascinated with this area. So since I'm on a tripod, this will be very easy to combine together. And why don't we? I'm just gonna go to Tools, Photoshop, Merge to HDR Pro. I'm gonna choose Remove Ghost because there is water movement. See, if I go darker, that means my shutter speed was faster, my water's frozen. I'd rather in this instance choose one with a slow exposure so my water is more soft and dreamy looking. Something like that. I think that's the prettiest. Tone and ACR. And look at that. That's the ACR version. Now I can just raise the shadow area knowing there's going to be no noise in here. Zero noise. Pull up the dehaze a little bit. Really bring up the clarity. Maybe pull down the saturation just a touch. Pull up the exposure and then pull down the highlights. 
and pull back down the exposure just a touch until it's to taste. Now for me, I think I'd probably pull this down to about here and then I'd create a mask, choose the brush, left bracket for a smaller brush, toggle off show overlay. Cause I think I'd probably like to just make the primary subject just a little brighter. Let's go ahead and pull up the clarity, dehaze a little bit, maybe open up the shadows. Just wanna give here just a bit of prominence. Maybe this is a little too bright. So create a new mask and I'm just good with a linear gradient. Pull this up, something like that. Toggle off show overlay. Maybe pull the highlights down just a touch. Maybe we can take this midpoint up just a little, something like that and click OK. So now we've taken these four images and compressed it into this image. And remember, we, we broke the rules a little bit. Like we only underexposed by one stop to capture more highlight detail. But there was so much shadow information that I wanted to make sure that I captured. I did a couple over. So you just finished an hour long video covering multiple real world scenarios of tons of different scenes. And we discussed when and why to use HDR, when should you not use HDR. So now I just wanted to give you a very quick three and a half minute review of the how. How do you capture it in your camera? What are the steps to process it through HDR Pro and tone it in ACR? Here you go. So what is high dynamic range photography? High dynamic range photography is a post-processing technique that involves combining photos taken with multiple different exposures into a single optimized image. So how do you shoot an HDR multi-exposure shot? Because it does start in camera. And this is easy. First, lock your camera down on a tripod. This is essential for proper image registration in the software later. You're going to compose and set your normal exposure and take the picture. Then you're going to leave your f-stop and your ISO alone, and you're only going to adjust your exposure with the shutter speed. And remember, if you're dropping below 1 60th of a second, even on a tripod, you still need to use your self-timer or cable release to trigger the shutter release. Because even when you are pushing the shutter release button, you could cause vibrations that would make your image slightly blurry. Now, what's the series? At minimum, you need at least three shots. So you're going to capture one shot at the normal exposure, whatever the camera tells you is a properly exposed normal shot. And then you're going to take one additional shot at two stops overexposed and another additional shot at two stops underexposed. That gives you three shots that should cover most normal brightness ranges. Now, if you have time, try shooting with five shots. Capture one at normal exposure, one shot at plus one stop over and plus two stops over, and go back and shoot another shot at minus one stop under and minus two stops under. This is gonna give you five shots to capture the entire brightness range. Now you can do this with up to seven to nine shots if the scene requires it and try experimenting with it. But typically I found I never need more than five shots to get great results. And most times I can get away with three. So how do you merge your shots in Photoshop? Well, I'd like to start in Adobe Bridge. So just go there, select your shots, and then just go up to the Adobe Bridge menu bar, go to Tools, go down to Photoshop, and choose Photo Merge. Let's do that now in real time. Tools, Merge to HDR Pro. Sometimes you might get a message saying Photoshop's busy with another task. You know it's not, it's a bug in the system. Just click yes that you'd like to cue this command and it will immediately get to work. It's gonna open all the images in Photoshop and then it will launch into Merged HDR Pro dialog box. Maybe some flags are moving. Let's see if I can remove ghost. I can, so there must've been some movement somewhere. So I get to choose, see at the bottom, I'm clicking to choose which image I like the best. Probably gonna choose this image. I'm gonna to complete toning in Adobe Camera Raw, click tone in ACR. It's gonna go back to Photoshop and then it's gonna launch in Adobe Camera Raw with all the image data from all six images. So now I can raise my shadow value and it's really gonna raise it. I can raise my exposure, pull down my highlights so I don't blow out anything. I can pull up my... So here I'm just doing a lot of the processing in Adobe Camera Raw, showing my workflow and the typical steps I take to optimize an image. Go back to the basic control panel and then ask, well, what else would I like to do? Maybe a little bit more. So again, this is where you process to your taste, right? 
after my processing, this is the image that I ended up with that I really enjoyed. So now go out there and shoot some really cool high dynamic rain images. It really changes the way you photograph. Hey, if you like this video, it helps. You can help me. Smack it, whack it, and crack a lack it. Take care. I like subscribers. That's awesome. Whoa. Yes! <laughs> Hey, you stayed to the end. You know what that means. You're awesome. I'm talking about you. Now get out of here.